let's assign the hybridizations to this molecule. How do you decide that this atom was sp3? Um, well, it's connected to uh, three different atoms, and it has a lone pair. Or, excuse me, two, uh, uh, well, it's connected to the carbon and then the two hydrogens, what I meant, sorry. No, what you said was right, I made a mistake. That's right. Okay. From the video series that you watched, you're remembering the rule for determining hybridization. The rule is that you add up the number of lone pairs and the number of attached atoms. Well, how many lone pairs do we have here? One. And how many attached atoms? Three. That gives us the number four, which should tell us the number of hybridized orbitals. Well, how do we get four hybridized orbitals if we have sp3? Because that's one s and three p's, which is four hybridized orbitals overall. This is what that video series called the, the rule for determining hybridization. But I think, pardon? Puckles or? Now, actually, yeah, Puckles rule is something different. Puckles rule actually is something we won't have to cover. That's going to be in your next term. Uh, so uh, that's why you stopped at video five. You didn't have to get to Huckel's rule. But the preliminaries to Huckel's rule is what we need for here. So this is just a rule for determining hybridization. However, it looks like you might have forgotten that there was also an exception to that rule. Do you remember how in the video series there was a rule for determining hybridization, but there was also a situation when the rule didn't work? Do you remember what's the exception? Actually. It's the, uh, if you have uh, one or more uh, lone pairs uh, and it's connected to an sp2, then it's an sp2. That's right. So does that exception apply here? Yes. So this should really be sp3. That's the most important lesson to have picked up from that video series for what we're going over right now. That's the main thing that you need to have picked up from that. After all, you were already supposed to have known about this rule from the first term. From the first term, you were already supposed to know that this is normally sp3, but most students have not learned about the exception because it, didn't, it wasn't important until this point in the course. But now, at this point in the course, it's important not just to know the rule, but also the exception. That's something you might want to go back and review. Sometimes people get so good at applying the rule that it's hard for them to remember now to look for that exception. So now this is really sp2 because it has a lone pair and it's connected to an sp2. So that now we don't apply the normal rule, now we would call this an sp2 as well. By the way, I cheated a little bit here, or I gave you a little bit more of a hint that you would get on the real test, because I drew in the lone pair. Normally, this would just be written like this. And we're just expected to know that carb anions have lone pairs. We just so we need to put that in our notes if we're not familiar with that. We should just know that carb anions have lone pairs, and then we would again know that we're applying the exception, and this would be sp2. Normally in organic chemistry, the lone pairs are not drawn. You're just expected to know when they exist. Why are we making such a big hullabaloo about whether this is sp2 or not? Well, does this have any p orbitals? One. Yeah, it has a p orbital. And these have p orbitals as well. So is this molecule going to be conjugated? Yes. Yes. But suppose we had stuck with our first guess and we had thought this was sp3. Well, do sp3 hybridized atoms have any p orbitals? So then it couldn't be conjugated. So this exception actually turns out to be very important. If we don't get the hybridization right, we can't see why this is considered conjugated. If we were thinking of this as sp3, then um, there would be no p orbitals. And then it could not be contributing to the conjugation. But now that we know about the exception, it's sp2, so there is a p orbital, so there is conjugation. In fact, that's the reason for the exception. Normally, this atom would be sp3. However, remember, do molecules want to be conjugated or not want to be conjugated? They do not want to be conjugated. Is conjugation a good thing or a bad thing for the molecule? Does it make it more stable or less stable? Well, it, it, uh, I guess it depends on its state. It makes it more stable positive charge, like a positive carbon. Now, in fact, I guess I should have emphasized that more as we were going, conjugation is pretty much always a good thing. And we should review that idea because it allows delocalization of the electrons. The more side-to-side -side overlapping p orbitals you have, the more different places the electrons can be in. Electrons always like being delocalized. 
Uh, even, if, even if there's no charge, they like being delocalized. If there's a positive or a negative charge, then the conjugation helps us to delocalize that positive or negative charge. But conjugation is pretty much always a good thing. Conjugation is always a good thing. It always makes the molecule more stable. Okay. And again, that's the reason why this carbon here chooses to break the normal rule, so to speak. The carbon says to itself, well, if I follow the normal rule for hybridization, I would be an sp3, and then I could not contribute to a conjugated system. Well, I'm going to prefer now to break this rule and be sp2, because that'll give me a p orbital that allows me to contribute to the conjugated system. So in fact, this is the whole reason for that exception. But remember, this would only happen if we have two conditions. We need both that this has a lone pair and that it's adjacent to an sp2. It has to both have a lone pair and be adjacent to an sp2, but that's what happened here. So we can consider that this p orbital is contributing this electron, this p orbital is contributing this electron, and this p orbital now is contributing the lone pair. Now this isn't an empty orbital, it's contributing the lone pair that was on this carbon. We can think of the, the lone pair as being on the carbon. Again, this is kind of misleading because really, all four of these electrons will now spread out over all three of these orbitals. All four of these electrons will be spread out over all of these in overlapping pi overlaps. We can also show that using resonance. Let's try using electron pushing arrows to draw the other resonance structure of this picture. That's something you're probably going to have to do on your exam. But resonance becomes more important in this chapter. There's probably going to be a question where you're uh, directed to draw the resonance structure. So this is a good time to review that. So can we put in any logical electron pushing arrows here? Well, ask yourself, who should be at the tail of an arrow? The pi bond. Who would, excuse me, the, the negative charge. Yeah, anytime we have a negative charge, we, anytime we have any type of charge, we want to focus on that. We know that charges are the unhappy parts of the molecule that need to get spread out. So we want to use electron pushing arrows to spread that out. Okay, now you've come up with the right arrows. That's a really important frame of mind to get into, to focus on the charges and ask if there's any way that you can make the charge more happy. Well, now you've come up with the right arrows and the right structure. We focus on this negative charge and ask, is there any way we can spread it out? Well, we can move the negative charge over here, but then we have to make room for that by moving these electrons over. And that would give us a resonance structure that looks like this. And again, that just emphasizes that, we, that these electrons here are not stuck in the orbitals that are contributing them. These four electrons are really spread over all four of these. For example, in this picture, I showed this orbital contributing the lone pair. But actually, that only matches this resonance structure. In this resonance structure, it would have been the left-hand atom that's contributing the lone pair. Well, that just emphasizes that the, all four electrons are really delocalized and spread out over all three of the atoms. There's no perfect way to draw that. One way to try to convey that is with this picture, and another way is by drawing the different resonance structures and trying to blend those together in our mind. The most important thing we just reviewed there was the exception to the rule for hybridization. If you've got a lone pair and you're connected to something sp2, you're also going to be sp2. And the reason that's important is, is it allows more types of molecules to be conjugated. Because if those atoms were just following the ordinary rule and being sp3, they couldn't be conjugated. One thing I would expect that you're going to see as an exam question is you're going to be given molecules and tested on whether they're conjugated or not. This molecule conjugated. Yes. Good. How do we know? Well, these are all sp2 hybridized atoms, so they all have p orbitals that they can, can contribute to the side-to-side -side overlapping p orbital structure. So how many side-to-side -side overlapping p orbitals would we get here? Four. Well, that's more than enough. Good. Uh, what page of his notes are you on, just out of curiosity there? So well, we are on the, basically the first slide. Okay, the first slide. Or 
the first slide after the title page. How about this molecule? Would this be conjugated? 